guys, welcome back to Garage 11 and here we are today, we're gonna to be looking at another episode of Behind the Build. Now this one's gonna be on this 1994 CR250. Iconic bike, we're just finishing up the final touches on it but we, we think it's good enough that we can go through and show you all the different bits and pieces we've done and what we went through to get it to this stage that you see now. Alright guys, so like I said, we're going to be talking about this 94 CR250. Now this one is part of a larger collection of bikes that we've done for one of our customers. We did the 125, same year that you would have seen um, in Dirt Action a, a year last year. Um, so he decided he wanted to get all three of the bikes. Well, we're going to try and get the 80 as well, but they're sort of a little bit thin on the ground. Um, we've got the 500 in the works too. So, But we're going to look at this, because this thing's this thing's super cool. We managed to get this bike in from the US. Um, we imported this bike for him, um, which is always a gamble. Like getting stuff sight unseen from the US, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, we were lucky with this one. It was completely filthy and dirty and 30 plus years of whatever um, on it. So we were super worried when we pulled it apart. However, it was actually in fantastic condition. It didn't really have too much wrong with it. Um, obviously, we went through everything again um, because there's no such thing as a half restoration. Um, no matter how tight or good something is, you always need to, to go through it. So what we, you, we sort of broke it down, stripped the bike down to a frame and inspected it. And the frame had no dents, nicks, nothing. Had our frame guy look at it. He confirmed that it was still straight after he put it in the jig, which is always good. Um, and you sort of get evidence of that as you're pulling these things down as well. Um, if a swing arm's tight to get out, if an engine's hard to remove from the chassis, guaranteed there's going to be a twist in there, which sort of leads you to believe that there's going to be a wider problem. But with this one, there wasn't, which was super cool. So we were lucky the forks and all that side of it was in really good shape once we pulled the old fork stickers off. As you can see, there's a couple of little marks and whatever else through, um, but they're definitely all in all in really nice shape. Um, you can see we've managed to get the original warning stickers for the forks as well, which is pretty cool. Guy in Italy manages to reproduce them for a whole plethora of bikes, road, on-road, off-road, whatever road, like he does a whole range of the warning stickers and all that sort of stuff. Um, so obviously new rims and spokes, because no matter how good a quality of the bike is or how good a condition it's in, they're always trashed, especially when they're that old, they're all rusted and whatever else. So we've relaced XL rims onto it with spokes, Axiom make the spokes for us as we need. Um, then while we're at it, we had all the hubs stripped and rebuilt. Um, and Cerakoted, this wheel isn't quite finished yet. As you can see, the, the axle still, we're still pulling things in and out a little bit. Um, but yeah, as you can see, everything sort of cleans up really nice. Once you get the Cerakote black on the hubs, it generally sets it off. Um, Motormaster OEM style front disc, which is really cool. Getting back to the hubs as well, like if you're powder coating them, Cerakote's pretty much the only way to go when you're talking about hubs because if you're talking about powder coat, yeah, you get some maybe some cooler finishes, some cooler design, uh, cooler colours, but the, the thickness of it really affects the spokes interference. So you've got to be careful, even Cerakote to a large extent, um, you've got to be careful of the spokes chafing. So whenever you ride on a bike that you've done that with, always be sure to check all your spokes and everything after your first sort of rides. Um, getting back to this though, OEM front brake line, new old stock. If you check out our video on our channel, you'll find out how and where we were able to get still brand new, genuine Honda front brake lines for these bikes. Can't remake them. It doesn't, you know, having that opaque style sheath on it really makes all the difference. And that's one of the things, you know, like when you're talking about points of difference or trying to do that, that little bit better, every bike we do, we try to do a little better. Um, so we've managed to find the proper brake lines for it. I mean, these bikes are never perfect. It, no bike is when you restore it because you're always dealing with something that's being restored. It's not brand new. So you work with what you can find at the time, what you've got. 
Kind of like the front plate here, as you can see, it is a UFO stadium plate. These particular bikes didn't have the feet on them. These had the old single ice cream plate style without the recess in the nuclear red. UFO will do them, but they won't do them exact. They'll do them pretty much like this, but cut off. Um, so getting one of those original plates is very expensive, very hard to find, and almost impossible. So for the sake of keeping the builds going in a timely manner, because this isn't a one-off for us, this isn't a hobby build, this isn't a, I've got five years to do it, this is a customer project. So we like to try and keep them going as best we can within reason. Um, so that's why we opted with the UFO, and it matches the 125 we did as well. Now, moving on to all the handlebars and the controls and everything else, these are an aftermarket handlebar. We get them in, and then we have them repowder coated white, which the bikes were originally. The bend isn't 100% accurate, but we do have a genuine set of new old stock bars here somewhere, and we've had them scanned, and we're gonna look at trying to reproduce them, so that might be a cool thing as well. Genuine grips, still readily available. Same with all the throttle linkage, oh, throttle linkage, the throttle mechanism. Cerakoted all of the master cylinder and whatever else, we've still got to change out the brake lever. Oh no, that's the right one, we had a silver one on it. Um, so they, these clean up quite nicely. As you can see, the Cerakote's a really nice uniform finish and it, it emulates what the original colours were, um, which is always, you know, hard to do. That's it's pretty much what we are, we're just refinishes. We're trying to look at what was and then trying to find ways of reproducing that. It's never easy and it can take time, but it's generally what makes the little things just that little bit better, if that makes sense. Um, like I said, all our frames are powder coated, um, which is something that we believe in for longevity, for uh, usability, for all that sort of stuff. If you say that a bike of this age is going to, if a powder coat cracks and you can't see it, if you're riding this thing to its original service requirements, sure, but I can't imagine too many of you guys are riding this thing twice a week, every week, worrying about frame stress. So we generally go with the powder coat option because it's a really nice way of getting a really good consistent coat over everything. Um, these graphics are done by Vision. Um, which was really good. We did have a couple of other, we had another company that gave us graphics for it and they didn't really fit overly great. So we had them redone, nice thin cut. Um, considering that we had to use UFO for everything, we stayed with the theme of the UFO colors because they do vary. This is actually a lot lighter in color than what the original nuclear red was. We have new old stock nuclear red plastics around the place and when you do compare them, they are very, very, very different. But, you know, like I said, it's uniform, it matches, it's what's available and that's how you try and work. Um, the tank is a VMX Racing's reproduction tank. They are probably the best reproduction tanks for the CR range. Um, I know there's other manufacturers that are doing them. However, the overall quality of that tank isn't very good. Whereas these ones, you don't have a lot of the tooling marks that you get on other tanks. The fit's really nice. It's just, it's all round, sets the whole bike off because if you just get a, a yellow tank because they do fade and change colour and put a white sticker over them, you can still see that it's not as clean as it could be. So getting the reproduction tank is definitely the best option um, short of finding a new old stock one. Now I know a new old stock one sort of goes for around the $3,000 mark. So if you're looking at, at restorations and looking at trying to get your bike looking really crisp, they are definitely the way to go. Where are we? So the exhaust we got lucky with, we managed to find a intact original OEM exhaust for it, which we were super lucky because that's definitely not something that pops up all the time. Um, because back in the day, you'd get a, a, a bike like this. You still do now. You, you buy a KTM and you pull the original exhaust off and you put a Pro Circuit and FMF or whatever on it. And no one wants the original pipes. They just go in the bin or hang up in Uncle Shed or whatever. So to find them, the funny thing is with a lot of these bikes, the stuff that no one wanted is the hardest stuff to find today. Uh, and the exhaust is definitely a big one. 
Front disc covers on like the 95, 96s is another one. And underneath the seat, Honda used to provide you with a mud flap. So what you would do is you'd clip it over the airbox when you're running in really wet conditions, really muddy conditions. Realistically, none of us are that game, or I'm not that game to ride in muddy conditions. So a lot of guys just threw them out. So to try and find that sort of stuff is really hard. We have a couple of them for my personal bikes, but to, like I said, for these things, if they do pop up, we grab them. But other than that, you very, very rarely see them. So it's a lot of that sort of stuff, you know, like the exhaust, it's, it's having that, trying to find those original things is, is definitely difficult to do. The muffler, we were able to find a fairly good original muffler. Um, Paul from Prime Pipeworks, he restores most or all of our exhausts exclusively um, and he did an absolutely amazing job at bringing that back. We're just waiting on Honda to give us some mounts to mount that up properly and that, that'll all be sort of hanging nicely and finished. Now, same with the, the engine. The engine was all rebuilt, um, hydroblasted in-house. All the engine stuff we do is in-house, um, except for our machining and obviously Nicosil and stuff like that. But looking at the cover here, these are the original covers that we had cleaned up. Now, we have got a very good friend of ours who's a master painter, automotive painter, and these were in such good shape that we were able to colour sample them off and then have them painted in two packs. So that's as original as I reckon you can get from a colour match point of view for those engine covers. Um, so that's, that's a really cool piece. That's, we love that sort of stuff, that point of difference, the detail, because when you look at the cases of the engine, it's not just a matter of hydroblasting the whole thing and going, yeah, cool, it's silver. It's not. There's so many different elements of silver in that engine that it, when you see those tone differences in colour, that's the thing that you go, oh, wow, that's, that's had that effort put into it. And that's what we try and do. It's not easy. Uh, we don't always get it right, but we do try our best every time we do something like that. So the engine was super cool. Like I said, we just used good aftermarket internals in it. Um, ProX is, is obviously, and Wozner, a lot of those good bearings, Japanese bearings we use, genuine Honda in this one, I think. Um, like most of our engines, unless we're asked otherwise, we try and do a blend of good OEM and good aftermarket, which is always just a happy medium from a price point of view, an accessibility point of view, and a parts availability point of view. Because when you are building these things, you have to take those three factors into consideration because it's not just, yeah, I'm going to do a complete OEM build. There's very few people that I know that have done an, a genuine 100% OEM build, either financially, time frame wise All those factors come into it. Um, so yeah, that, that was the engine. Uh, like I said, standard carby. Uh, we try to keep these bikes as original as we can, especially for this gentleman and the collection. They all sort of match, which is the way we wanted to go with it. Um, one thing that you can see in here, if you have a look in the radiator area here, we've got these radiator louvers. Now, most of you will know that they are impossible to find. There is a company that does make them here in Australia. So I think they're about $200 a set and they're absolutely amazing to use. I believe the company's called TLR, but what we'll do is I'll put a link in the description. You can have a look if you are chasing, um, if you are chasing radiator louvers for your CR. They do the black ones and the translucent or the neutral colored ones, which is, is really helpful. And that's the thing with this community. I know a lot of guys, you know, get all up in arms about remanufactured products and replicas and all that sort of stuff. Without the replicas, this doesn't happen. So you can get all excited and upset and give us your opinion as much as you want, but the guys who are out there putting the financial effort in, the time effort in to get these parts happening again, they're the only ones that matter because eventually all the genuine stuff's gonna dry up. Um, so that's why we're sort of looking, like the handlebars, looking at reproducing those because it would just be way better if we could just get them again. Um, Honda are never gonna re-release them because why? So. But yeah, that's, that's definitely sort of that sort of side of it. Um, engine, exhaust, the suspension's all done in house. Um, the shock, like I said, the shock body, we strip it all apart. It all gets hydroblasted. We use genuine seals. Um, the spring gets repowder coated. Like I said, it's all, it's a sum of all its parts. So when you pull a shock apart, it's actually quite 
a lot involved. There's powder coating, there's zinc plating, there's hydroblasting, all that sort of stuff. So we try, and anodizing for some of them. So we try and replicate as much of the original finishes as we can. Like I said, it's not always easy and it doesn't always go to plan, but we definitely try our hardest to. Like I said, all the warning labels and stuff, which is those nice little bits of detail that we try and add to it, um, which always helps. So it's just one of those things. Um, Airbox is another prime example of what we were talking about with remanufacturing parts. So a guy in Bays, uh, no, sorry, in Ballarat has these reproduced, um, which is, is awesome because having the white airbox back again is that point of difference. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at just another half yellow stained, destroyed airbox, which is what makes these bikes look new. Yeah, it's not original. Get over it. And that's sort of where we're at with a lot of those people. You know, like as long as they keep making this stuff, we can keep these bikes alive. And stuff like that is, is absolutely unreal. If you don't know what goes into having one of these and the cost of having something plastic like that remanufactured, do some research, come back to me when you, when you have because it's so expensive. Um, and for someone to go and put the time and energy into that, is absolutely unreal and it makes these bikes stand out just that so much more. Where are we? So the seat, um, this is a seat cover from the UK, it's the proper nuclear red or the fluorescent red so it matches the rest of the bike. Seat foam is a locally made seat foam by Strike uh, and we trim them here ourselves. Um, and you know, seats are always a hard one because you've got to try and get them to line up nice and sit properly and whatever else. So when you can get it looking pretty good, it's, it's definitely a rewarding feeling. Um, and this definitely, you know, it could be, everything can be better, but we definitely have, you know, that sits quite nicely on there, which is, is really cool. Um, you know, when you start seeing the colours and the graphics and the seat covers and stuff come onto these bikes, it definitely makes all the difference. You start to see it come alive. Um, there's a few stages when you are restoring a bike like this which do hit you pretty hard and the first one's when you see the frame all in powder coat or paint, the second's when the engine's cradled into it, third is when it's on its wheels and the fourth is when you start seeing colour come out to it, that really vivid colour that these bikes are famous for and that's, this is the sum of all those parts, like it, it definitely stands out. And that's why a lot of the bikes from the 90s and that styling from the 90s is still such a, a desirable thing today because it was so out there and so cool to see. Um, and, you know, I've said time and time again, I think bike manufacturers have completely given away all their creativity and design ability because you look at modern bikes and they just don't hit the way they used to. Um, and this is why we are so passionate about these things because they were out there. The gear, the hair, the bikes, everything was just so cool. Um, so it's, that's why we like to sort of keep these things alive. Swing arm um, was all been restored as best we can. Um, we hydroblast obviously the center stock there and then sand back all of the spars to try and give you that extruded look. We did experiment with trying to get a different, because the actual sand cast elements of the swing arms had like a raw anodizing on them. Now, we did try an experiment trying to get those colors back. It's not, not as easy as you might think. Um, but I think we might even try and see if it's possible to anodize the whole swing arm and then just sand all the anodizing back through here to try and bring those tones back again. Um, because that is, like I said with the engine, yeah, it's all silver, but it's a whole heap of different gradients of silver and that's what makes it stand out from a detail point of view. Um, so it's definitely something we'll be looking at, trying to get all that stuff happening, but new bearings in the swing arm, linkages are all cleaned up, all new bearings in them. Same with the brakes, like the brakes are a massive job. There's definitely like a whole couple of days in doing brakes on something like this, by the time you strip them apart, um, zinc plate all the components, hydroblast everything, clean everything up. It definitely takes a long time, but when you start to see it all sort of come together, it definitely makes it stand out and it pops, you know. It's, it's one of those things where, like I said before, and I'll say it again, it's the sum of all its components, you know. You look at the different, the, the new brake pads, the colour in them, the zinc plating, you know, you've got the 
clear plastic and stuff for the guards around it, it all makes it come together. And that's the biggest part of all of this is how that looks. Um, so this is pretty much, you know, I mean, actually on this side of the bike, if you pop around here and have a look, you'll have to forgive us, we are still missing a couple of little bits and pieces, but we've managed to find new old stock ignition cover for this one. Um, same with the chain guide, all that sort of stuff. And it's those things that do make it sort of pop as well, because to try and find these, these are getting harder and harder and being plastic and right where the gear lever should be, they just get trashed. But when you can find them and you get that really crisp, brand new feeling coming out of it, that's, that's what makes these things stand out. And like I've said before, we've never built a perfect bike. And to be honest, we probably never will build a perfect bike. But what we try and do is we try and hit all of those different elements as much as we possibly can with each of our builds. Um, because it is all a compromise. Like I always do say, building these things isn't easy. It's not cheap. Um, and it takes a lot of experience to get them across the line. Um, and we've managed to commercialize that, which adds another element of uh, stress to it as well, but that's okay. But as you can see, this thing, standing back now and looking at it, you just go, wow, this is, this is incredible. You know, like, and we will, we'll get it into the photo studio. Um, we'll get some really nice photos of it, like we did with the last one. Um, I think once the 500's done, we're gonna get the trio of them all together. Um, but this is just, yeah, I mean, you look at it and it, it just, it oozes, excitement, it oozes nostalgia, it oozes all of that stuff that we all remember, we all loved and you know we, we want back again. And that's why we created Garage 11, to, to bring that back and to bring those memories back and to keep a lot of this stuff alive, you know, whether it be from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s or even early 2000s, it's, it's something that we love to do. So this is it, this is the CR250. Lovely little bit of a deep dive into what we've gone into to try and get it as good as it can be. Um, like I said, if you're enjoying the channel, if you're liking what we're doing, um, let us know. As I always say, if you don't like what we're doing, that's your problem, not mine. Um, but yeah, we're bringing you a lot more content, a lot more often, and a lot more of this sort of stuff, and behind the scenes of what we're doing. You know, we've got the Boydie bike we're gonna be doing. We've got a 96 CR250 that Lee Hogan's gonna throw a leg over, um, as well as a CR500, so he's gonna be working pretty hard on that day. Um, but yeah, all right guys, my name's Kane. Thanks for watching. See you next time.